Today we're exploring Pueblo, Colorado, a city that was once crucial for the mining and railroad industry's success during the state's infancy. I'm going to go in-depth with Pueblo's history and geography, as well as give you first-hand advice on what we found and what to expect if you go there. We're Ski Lodge, and we're exploring Colorado one town at a time. Let's get started. Pueblo was initially inhabited by various Native Americans, including the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Comanche, among others. In the 1540s, Spain claimed the land up to the Arkansas River as their own, but this was disputed by the Indians, who kept Spanish progress limited to Santa Fe and the San Luis Valley. There is a popular belief that numerous Spaniards entered Pueblo County, but only one ever actually did. Juan Batista Anza, who chased Comanche Chief Cuerno Verde along the Wet Mountains before killing him near Colorado City in 1779. This event actually led to the creation of the county's first recorded community, San Carlos de los Jupes, near modern-day Vineland, which was where the remaining Comanches fled following their leader's death. In 1682, France claimed the Mississippi River system, which included the Pueblo area. This was disputed by Spain, who didn't officially cede the land to them until 1800. Immediately afterwards, France sold the land to America with the Louisiana Purchase, which increased Spain's reluctance to release their part of the claim. This prevented safe American exploration and settlement south of the Arkansas River. Undeterred, Zebulon Pike entered Colorado in 1806 with instructions to find the Colorado River headwaters. Following the north bank of the Arkansas River, they made camp at the confluence of Fountain Creek where Pueblo sits today. Pike left most of his team at this camp while he went off to try summiting Pike's Peak. The mission failed and they continued west from Pueblo after getting back. Facundo Melgares then became the second Spaniard to pass through Pueblo shortly after with orders to detain Pike. In 1821, Mexico gained independence, and unlike their Spanish predecessors, they welcomed American trade. This led to the creation of the Santa Fe Trail, which increased American traffic in the region, primarily explorers and trappers during the 1820s and 30s. The land south of the Arkansas River became part of Texas when they formed a separate republic in 1836, but this was disputed by Mexico. Fort Pueblo was constructed at the intersection of the Pioneer and Cherokee Trails in 1842, becoming vital not only to the immediate area, but also bridging the gap between Bent's old and new forts out east. Unfortunately, Fort Pueblo met a tragic end when it was raided and destroyed by Utes and Apaches, who killed and kidnapped around 20 people Christmas Eve 1854. The fort's ruins were then left abandoned with no plans to return. That is, until the Colorado Gold Rush of 1858. Fort Pueblo wasn't rebuilt, but the location was seen as economically viable, so Americans returned, establishing the town of Pueblo the following summer. Pueblo first grew as a crossroads trading location, and the last major stop before reaching the Rocky Mountains when traveling west from the Santa Fe. As Colorado's population increased and more people settled the area, farming and ranching picked up on the St. Charles Mesa, bringing Pueblo into the limelight for its agricultural potential. This growth continued with large ranches established at Vineland, Avondale, and Rock Canyon, Pueblo really took off in 1872 with the arrival of the railroad. It was in a great location with silver mines west, coal mines south, Kansas trails east, and of course Denver to the north. Trains also led to the creation of a temporary steel mill and the construction of two separate housing communities for the workers, creatively called Central and South Pueblo, which were unrelated to regular Pueblo at the time. An electric trolley connected the three cities in 1878, and the Colorado State Insane Asylum was built the following year northwest of town. In 1880, Pueblo finally opened the permanent steel mill, which was first operated by Colorado Coal and Steelworks. Later merged with Colorado Fuel Company to form CF&I, this mill became Pueblo's legacy as it was a literal powerhouse of the western U.S. for some time. The mill's primary housing community, and Pueblo's fourth and final town, Bessemer, was built in 1881. The three Pueblos plus Bessemer consolidated into the city of Pueblo a while later. Pueblo's population grew over 600% in the 1890s with both American and foreign workers coming to work in the mines in the steel mill. The St. Charles Mesa Canal also opened, exploding farmland production east of town, which led to the creation of Avondale and Vineland. The rest of the mesa was platted with its familiar lanes placed a quarter mile apart from each other to the edge of the county. The beginning of the 20th century was turbulent, starting with the United Mine Workers strike, which halted production in 1903. Ten years later, national attention was brought to Pueblo when hundreds of workers left town during the CF&I strike. They formed a tent camp 70 miles south near Ludlow and underwent weeks of conflict with the National Guard, who eventually burned the camp down after the strikers ran out of ammunition. Unknown to the Guard, women and children were hiding in cellars below and were burned alive, which became known as the Ludlow Massacre. Naturally, this caused further conflict, including the Ten Days' War. 
It took a year and presidential intervention, but the strike was resolved just in time to prepare for World War I, which drafted many of the remaining workers. This actually increased Pueblo's diversity as additional foreign workers were brought in to cover positions. In 1921, the Great Pueblo Flood washed most of the Union District away, killing over 100 people and causing millions in damages. It was said to have lasted three days and occurred from heavy rainfall in the mountains upstream on both Fountain Creek and the Arkansas River. During Reconstruction, the river was completely redirected and a large levee was built to prevent it from ever happening again. It was said that Al Capone frequented southern Colorado during Prohibition, using Aguilar, Trinidad, and Pueblo as both cool-down spots for his guys and storage locations in between his Chicago and Las Vegas operations. This connection and the large number of Italian mill workers is where Pueblo's mob history is said to originate. The national energy shift from coal to natural gas occurred in the 30s, affecting Pueblo's economy, though less than the actual mining communities. World War II brought lots of military attention to Colorado's front range, with the Pueblo Army Air Base and Chemical Depot being built just east of town. Following the war, Pueblo suddenly found itself filled with retired vets deciding to stay, nearly doubling its population by 1960. The city was later given the air base, turning it into Pueblo Memorial Airport. Realizing post-war Colorado was outgrowing its water supply, the Frying Pan Arkansas Project began constructing five storage reservoirs, including Lake Pueblo. Built in the early 70s and opening in 1982, this became Colorado's sixth largest lake by surface area and fourth by total volume upon completion. Pueblo West was constructed in anticipation of the lake, opening in 1969 on the North Shore as a semi-rural housing community. The 80s and 90s saw stagnation, with Pueblo's population surpassed by Colorado Springs. The steel mill failed as the gas crisis ended, filing for bankruptcy in 1990 before being sold entirely three years later. This was devastating to the community as a mill employed nearly half of all working adults. Pueblo then turned away several tech companies due to poor future planning, resulting in severe decline while Colorado Springs and Denver flourished. Naturally, the crime rate increased as the household income dropped, and in no time a town of less than 100,000 people developed big city problems. Trying to repair the damage, Pueblo redeveloped the downtown Union District in the early 2000s with the construction of the Riverwalk, Convention Center, and dozens of multi-use buildings. This has turned it into the most approachable part of town, as other neighborhoods still remain far behind. Pueblo today is nationally portrayed as a crime-ridden, gang-ran desert town, which isn't true, but not far from true either. Economic growth is pushed away in an attempt to prevent inflation and overcrowding, but this limits the amount of high-paying jobs available, causing a brain drain. Pueblo's cost of living is high as well, and though it's still the cheapest metro area in the state, it's getting worse as more people arrive after being priced out of other front-range cities. But despite these issues, Pueblo isn't dying, still experiencing population growth year over year. It's the core of the Pueblo metro area, which totals over 200,000 when you include Reliant counties. It also has its own tourism industry thanks to its Victorian architecture, rich western history, green chili and marijuana industries, and of course Lake Pueblo, the most visited state park in Colorado. With all this, I believe Pueblo actually has a bright future, though there are rumors of change including moving the state fair up north among other things. So, probably a slight population increase, higher prices, and hopefully a lower crime rate, but we'll see. Pueblo is located at the confluence of the Arkansas River and Fountain Creek, 100 miles south of Denver. It is Pueblo County's seat and largest city with 111,000 residents, but its support extends an hour in each direction to include Fremont, Huerfano, and Custer counties. This makes the Pueblo Metro's population nearly 230,000, the fourth largest in the state, and also means Canyon City, Walsenburg, and Westcliff are members too, despite the distance. The climate is High Plains Desert, with primarily short, scrubby plants and cacti making up the landscape, and very few trees except along the waterways. I-25 is the primary artery running north-south through the middle of Pueblo, getting you to Trinidad or Denver in about two hours. US-50 runs through the north side, connecting Pueblo West and Canyon City West, and La Junta to the east. There are two other state highways as well, 96 which runs to West Cliff or Boone, and 78 west of Beulah. The Arkansas River flows east through the heart of Pueblo, meeting with Fountain Creek just southeast of downtown. Lake Pueblo and its massive dam are found west of town and easily identified on a map. Lake Minnequa is also easily spotted, but it's been closed to recreation since the mid-70s. Also notice that the Pueblo area is wide, not tall, tricking I-25 motorists into thinking it's a much smaller city. As we zoom in, you'll see subtle cliffs lining the river, which itself is the lowest point of town as the elevation rises every direction but east. 
Most of Pueblo is on a north-south grid pattern, with only the old south and central neighborhoods deviating from this with diagonal grids. Downtown is still split into three distinct sections, an ode to the old setup before full incorporation, and it is here that you'll find most of Pueblo's attractions. The rest of town is primarily residential, with the newest neighborhoods and most amenities found towards the edges of town. Pueblo's weather is typical for the Colorado Front Range, with warm summers and mild winters. A normal July day will reach the 90s, then drop into the 60s overnight. The summer also brings Colorado's annual monsoon season, which produces weekly or even daily thunderstorms from June to August. Its low-lying location and unique placement from the surrounding mountains means Pueblo gets much less precipitation than most of the state. Storms are known to form over or next to the mountains, and the drop in both elevation and humidity towards Pueblo makes them split or weaken as they approach. This is often a blessing in disguise as Pueblo enjoys more sunny days, less severe hailstorms, and fewer tornadoes than other front range cities. Despite the lack of trees, wildfires can still be a threat in the woodland along lakes and rivers, and there have been at least three wildfire events since 2010. Pueblo often experiences the best winter weather in all of Colorado with an average high temperature of 47 degrees in January. Overnight lows rarely dip below 20, but cold snaps do happen, with frigid air often working its way up the Arkansas River. Pueblo receives very little snow compared to the rest of the Front Range, with an average of only 25 inches per year, usually spread out across only a dozen storms or so. Thanks to the Banana Belt effect, Puebloans can often enjoy the winter afternoons outside, while regional neighbors are stuck dealing with the weather. We arrived in Pueblo parking downtown off of Victoria. First impressions were good as we looked around the immediate area, which consisted of the Riverwalk, Vale Hotel, and PBR headquarters. The old downtown power plant looms tall over the rest of the buildings, reminding us right away that Pueblo is an industrial city. We walked down the steps of the Riverwalk, which deposited us at the West End Waterfall. This is probably the most photographed spot in town, looking picturesque any time of day. During the summer, they offer boat rides from end to end, and it's one of the few places in town with continuously unlocked public bathrooms. Shops, restaurants, and bars line the bottom floor of every building, and there were lots of people walking, jogging, and biking past us at 11 a.m. We climbed the stairs to Union Avenue, Pueblo's best and most popular street to visit. Five different flags flapped in the wind above us, Spain, France, Mexico, Texas, and America, which represent the various countries Pueblo has been a part of over the years. Filled with antique stores, local shops, and cafes, Union always has something to look at or do. Pueblo has more murals than anywhere we've been so far, with nearly every available canvas being filled with extraordinary art, and this continued throughout the trip. After checking out some stores, we turned onto C Street, where the Union Train Depot and Neon Alley are located. Neon Alley looks amazing at night, becoming extremely popular for Instagram and car pictures. The Union Depot looks better during the day, taking up the entire south block. It no longer operates as a train station, but it's still a treat to look at and walk around. Shops make up the bottom floor, and luxury apartments are above. We crossed the Arkansas River towards Apriendo Avenue. This was South Pueblo's downtown area back in the day, indicated by signs along the street. Rawlings Library is undeniable with massive height compared to everything else around it. Its modern architecture catches the eye with a bridge, glass tower, and of course the iconic roof overhang. Across the street in the middle of Abriendo is the Christopher Columbus statue, which has been a target for vandalism the past few years. Other features of Abriendo are the old theater, drugstore, and Taffy's Candy. Some of Pueblo's best-known Victorian mansions are found throughout the neighborhood behind these businesses. We circled around a main, which we then followed back across a river towards the new Justice Center, before cutting back to Union to eat at the Gold Dust Saloon. This is one of Pueblo's oldest restaurants and had excellent food. Since we were in Pueblo, I had a slopper, which is a cheeseburger smothered in local green chili. It was excellent, and we were happily full as we continued back to Maine towards a convention center. Out front are the Home of the Hero statues, which showcase the four Pueblo veterans who won Congressional Medals of Honor, the most of any one city. We then crossed Civic Center to Santa Fe Avenue, where we admired the Sangre de Cristo Art Center, but otherwise not much else on this stretch. At first we were planning to walk all the way to Mineral Palace Park, but our eyes deceived us into thinking it was closer than it was. By the time we got to 4th Street, we were getting tired and lazy, and my phone battery was running low, so we circled back to Maine instead. Had we have continued, we would have passed through Pueblo's business district with the city's tallest buildings. We would have also seen several ornate churches and the large, detailed Pueblo County Courthouse, but hey, that leaves more to see on another trip. The kids were also disappointed that they didn't get to play at all, as downtown Pueblo doesn't have any parks or playgrounds. We turned south on Main, which is actually one of the coolest blocks in town. 
The buildings are tall but historic, and there were a few more unique shops and murals to check out. Unfortunately, this also seemed to be a homeless hotspot, as several of them were walking around, at least two of them muttering loudly, and it didn't get better as we squiggled around back towards Victoria past the bus station. We approached the El Pueblo Museum, which sits in the actual location of the original Fort Pueblo, taking a break in the shaded grass next to their parking lot. We then checked out Sister Cities Plaza, Memorial Hall, and the Vale Hotel before disappearing down the narrow alley between buildings back to the car. Pueblo is a city with both good and bad sprinkled throughout town like a mosaic. It has some of the most vivid and interesting history in the entire state of Colorado and has really been involved with a bit of everything throughout the years. Some positives about Pueblo are that it has a lot of activities to do for a city its size, like the Pueblo Zoo, the Arts and Convention Centers, Lake Pueblo, and even its own mall. The downtown Union District is well kept and expanding every year, and public transit can take you to the very edges of city limits if you need. Pueblo also has the best local food around with its signature green chili and excellent Mexican food. But this is where the compliments begin to end, especially if you stay longer than a weekend or make your way into other parts of town. Starting small, it's not the most scenic city, comprised mostly of old single-family homes and 80s apartment buildings. Pueblo's placement at the bottom of three hills in a desert environment don't provide much to see anywhere even if you try. It's also pretty spread out, so unless you want to ride the bus and walk from the closest stop, driving is essential. Finally, and the one you've all been waiting for, is that the crime rate and homeless population are horrendous. Pueblo has always topped Colorado and sometimes even national charts for having an extremely high homeless population and excessive crime, both violent and nonviolent. Its lower prices and warmer temperatures attract a rough crowd, and gangbanging seems to have become a generational rite of passage for some families. I never judge a book by its cover, but it's guaranteed that you'll be approached by beggars while walking around the busier parts of town. You'll see a fair amount of beat-up, plateless cars passing by on the roads, and can even play the game, spot the face tattoo whenever you go out. But, if this is the worst Colorado has to offer, then it's really not as bad as it could be. We didn't encounter any issues while out, so it didn't ruin our trip, and you shouldn't let it deter you from checking out the town. Just treat it like a bigger city than it is. Taking our experiences and opinions into account, here's where we've ranked Pueblo so far. We hope you enjoyed learning about Pueblo with us and that you'll join us next time as we continue our mission to visit Colorado's most important and prominent towns when we visit Lakewood, Denver's second largest suburb making up most of the western metro area. It'll be our 29th trip and puts us within a year of visiting all towns within a two-hour drive of our house. See you next month. Thanks for watching.